Hello, everyone, and welcome to this online event. Um, Simone, when you want, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Simone Borghesi. I'm the director of FSR Climate, the research group on climate change at the European University Institute. At FSR Climate, we are currently running a project named Life Ditches, where Ditches stands for Deepening International Cooperation on Emission Trading. And this project um, involves the regulator of uh, six main emission trading systems around the world, namely Europe, Switzerland, California, Quebec, uh, New Zealand, and China. The regulators are represented in what is called the Carbon Market Policy Dialogue, which aims at deepening cooperation among uh, Europe and the other emission trading system and looking for a possible alignment and the topic of today, linking, possible linking of emission trading system in a future perspective. So uh, our project aims to uh, foster the dialogue uh, among the regulators in the carbon market policy dialogue and to inform them, uh, providing background reports and information concerning the various ETSs, their differences, their uh, main features in a comparative perspective. The CMPD, as we call it, the Carbon Market Policy Dialogue, um, is based on three meetings uh, that will occur during the project. The project started in September last year and is going to finish at the end of next year. And um, the three meetings will uh, be based or will focus on uh, five main topics. Uh, the difference in ambitions, the price control mechanisms, the carbon leakage prevention measures, uh, the offsets, the use of offsets, and the possible reform of the ETSs in view of their further alignment in the future. So what we do is uh, providing reports that inform the CMPD. And today we want to present two of these uh, reports that uh, we wrote as FSR Climate together with the external collaborators uh, of the project. One for each of the main ETSs I mentioned before. To discuss the, the two uh, reports, one on the difference in ambitions and the other on the various price containment mechanism, today uh, it's a big pleasure to, to let the stage to uh, two components of, of my team. As you see, they are already connected and they are Stefano Verde, who is the deputy director of the team and Giulio Galdi, uh, research associate uh, of the team. Stefano, uh, I used to call him the, our uh, memory because he has been uh, with the team for eight years, I think. Uh, he was um, with uh, Danny Ellerman at the very beginning, and then with Xavier Lavandeira, and, and he continued with me uh, through these years. And Julio is a brand new entry, if I may say so, uh, but uh, we are very happy to have him on board, and he's learning very fast, and uh, you will see he's giving a great uh, added value to the team. So together with Albert Ferrari, who you cannot see at the moment, he's hiding behind the curtains, uh, they, they form a, a fantastic team, I would say. So having said that, I would like to leave you uh, the stage uh, first to, to Stefan and then to Giulio. Let me just remind how the, our uh, online uh, webinars are structured. Uh, we will have a, a presentation by each of the two speakers, around 15, 20 minutes presentation, one for each report. And then we will move to questions from the audience. And uh, in this regard, I invite you to write your questions in the Q&A that you find in the, in the link, uh, or if you want also in the chat, 
uh, the chat it would be more for comments if you want and q a for questions but in any case you are in warmly invited to uh, be active and intervene so having said that stefano the floor is yours Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah. Thank you, Simone, and uh, thanks to all people attending this webinar. Uh, this is the outline of my, well, this is the outline of my presentation. And, uh, well, which entirely draws on the two texts that you see at the bottom, the background report, uh, that we prepared for the carbon market policy dialogue in September, and the corresponding policy brief, which we wrote after the CNPD. I will start by discussing uh, the concept of environmental ambition uh, on NTS. I will then go through the main considerations that the literature offers regarding the implications for linking of differences in environmental ambition. We'll then take a look at how the six emission trading systems represented in the CMPD compare in terms of environmental ambition. And finally, I report a few insights that have emerged from the CMPD. Now, let us start then by thinking for a minute about the very meaning of environmental ambition of an ETS. This generally refers to the quantity of abatement that an ETS promises to deliver. And so accordingly, we propose that the ambition be assessed considering three dimensions, emissions coverage, stringency, and determinacy. The emissions coverage on ETS simply is the share of a jurisdiction's total, emis green, total emissions that are regulated by the ETS. Say for the, for the UETS, for example, emissions coverage is currently about 45% of the EU's total greenhouse gas emissions. Stringency refers to the level of targeted abatement. Uh, and in theory, uh, targeted abatement is relative to business as usual emissions. That is emissions that would materialize if the ETS was not there. Determinacy uh, refers to the degree of certainty about regulated emissions staying below a certain level. And importantly, this dimension allows us to distinguish between absolute cap ETSs also known as cap and trade systems, and relative cap ETSs like China's forthcoming national ETS. Now, um, when it comes to linking, emissions coverage per se do not really matter, uh, does not really matter. Uh, however, the absolute volume of regulation, regulated emissions does. Um, this is the size of the, what usually is referred to as the size of an ETS. And this is firstly because the greater an ETS relative to its linking partner or partners, the greater its influence in determining post-link allowance prices. Now, as I said, target stringency refers to targeted abatement relatively, relative to business as usual emissions. The issue with business as usual emissions though, is that their estimates necessarily come with a margin of error. Therefore, alternative stringency measures that are commonly considered are A, targeted abatement relative to historical emissions, say X percent by 2030 minus X percent by, by 2030 relative to 2005 emissions, and B, allowance prices as a proxy, as a proxy for the system's marginal cost of compliance. Between, between these two metrics of stringency, there are reasons why allowance prices are preferable. And notably, uh, abatement relative, relative to historical emissions does not account for the many determinants of regulated emissions other than the ETS itself. Whereas allowance prices do account for that, uh, basically by reflecting allowance, allowance demand. Especially when comparing allowance prices across ETSs, however, one needs to keep in mind the other various factors that along with stringency determine allowance prices. Abatement technology also determines allowance scarcity. And above all, different markets distortions may play a role. You see there uh, policy uncertainty, investor myopia, market power, and others.
Now, moving to the, uh, to the literature, what the literature tells us. Different environmental ambition uh, between ETSs have different implications for their linking. Uh, the, the literature commonly distinguishes between economic, so, uh, between economic, actually environmental, and political implications. And so now let's see what they are. In partial equilibrium analysis, the efficiency gain of a linkage, which is the corresponds to the shaded area in the graph of a linkage between the UTS and hypothetical uh, US ETS stems from differences in marginal compliance costs between ETSs. In so much as they do reflect differences in marginal compliance costs, pre-link differences in allowance prices are a key indicator of the efficiency gain. The efficiency gain, the efficiency gain will partly accrue to the high price ETS, the net buyer here, the EU in this case, in the form of abatement cost savings and it will partly go to the low price ETS, the net seller, in this case, the US, in the form of revenue from sold allowances. Importantly, when allowing for administrative costs or for, or for general equilibrium effects, it is possible that a jurisdiction does not expect a net benefit from linking its ETS to another. And if so, it will not engage in a linkage. Also, the efficiency gain uh, just described is not the only economic benefit that can be expected. We'll also have greater market liquidity and greater price stability, even in the absence of price differences before linking. Now moving to environmental implications. The question here is whether differences in environmental ambition between ETSs that consider linking can lead to higher or lower emissions than if the same systems operated independently. The literature emphasizes situations that result in increased emissions. Notably, linkages between absolute and relative cap ETSs can be risky, in that as a result of linking and of the consequent adjustment in allowance prices, emissions may increase in the relative cap ETS. A second way overall emissions may increase is if linking of any type of ETS induces strategic loosening of the stringency of an ETS. And therefore, a linking agreement should prevent this mutuality. On the other hand, linking also offers an opportunity for cooperatively increasing environmental ambition. By reducing the cost of achieving a given emission reduction target, linking offers the opportunity to embrace a more ambitious one, a more ambitious target. Now, political implications. Uh, political implications of differences in environmental ambition are also potentially decisive for a linkage to, get, to take place and its success. Political challenges arise with two types of distributional effects. One is the revenue transfer between jurisdictions. For a jurisdiction that is net important of allowances, substantial revenue transfers from the domestic economy into that of the exporting jurisdiction might not be politically acceptable. At the same time, changes in allowance prices after linking determine winner and winners and losers within each jurisdiction. Allowance buyers in the high price ETS and sellers in the low price system benefit from the link. Conversely, allowance sellers in the high price ETS and buyers in the low price system are worse off after the link. A third political factor that can weigh decisively against the realization of a linkage is the partial loss of policy control. And the limit to policy control here regards re regulatory adjustments as well as acceptance of co-determined allowance prices. Now, in the last few minutes of my presentation, I give you some information about the ETSs represented in the CMPD. And then, uh, and then to follow a few insights from the CIPD itself. So in this table, I've reported some data that give us a sense of the difference between ETSs over the dimensions of environmental ambition discussed before. And uh, as you can see, first, there's larger variation across ETSs in terms of emissions coverage, which is the, uh, first, the first line there. 
Uh, however, as I said before, for the purpose of linking, differences in, in emissions coverage per se are not really relevant. Difference in size are, and you can see in the last row, in the last row how big these differences are. So you can see uh, 1,800 million tons of CO2 under the, ETA, under the UETS in 2020, and uh, as little as 4.9 million tons of CO2 under the, the Swiss ETS, uh, 334 for the Californian, uh, 54 for the Quebec ETS, and about 30, it is estimated now for, uh, no, well, for the New Zealand is about 30, and uh, about 300,000 and 300 for the, it's estimated for the Chinese uh, forthcoming national ETS. Now, concerning environmental determinacy, all emission trading systems except the uh, Chinese uh, ETS have absolute caps. Uh, it is planned that China's ETS will move to an absolute cap, but after its initial phase. Um, and finally, concerning the prices, as you can see, currently those of the of the UTS and the Swiss CTS, which are linked as of this year, 2020, uh, are around 30 euros per ton of CO2 equivalent. We then have New Zealand at about 20 euros per ton, and then California and Quebec also linked, fully linked, uh, as of 2014, uh, at around 15 euros per ton of CO2. Of course, no data are available for the Chinese ETS yet. Um, but in the graph, well, these are the uh, prices of uh, UTS and Swiss and the Swiss ETS. This is the California Quebec. This is the New Zealand. And these, I was referring to these in the graph, we can see the uh, prices of the uh, local pilots, a pilot ETS in China. And if you consider the highest price is that of uh, uh, Beijing. And it's about, uh, it's currently about 10 euros per ton of CO2. So there are these different levels of, uh, of prices that we can uh, observe across the ETS in the CMPD. Now, finally, insights from the, uh, from the CMPD, as I promised. Here I decided to focus on the importance of trust when choosing a linking partner. And at the same time, on the other hand, the importance of regulating in advance possible delinking processes. So first, when choosing a linking partner, many factors are weighed up beyond design compatibility and differences in environmental ambition. Commonality of broader long-term policy objectives and trust are key for choosing the linking partners. Second, forms of restricted linking, which was confirmed by the CMPD, uh, can be a usual compromise between full linking which in a way is a riskiest form uh, in a po political sense, in a policy sense uh, of linking, and no linking at all. Third, good. Third, as I said, it is desirable that the linking process be regulated in advance, and perhaps more so than has generally been the case until now. So these are insights that we, uh, uh, well, selected insights from the CMPD that emerged uh, last September. Okay, I think that I, uh, I stop here. And uh, thank you for following. I look forward to your questions. And uh, I think I should pass it on to, uh, to Julio or to Simone if you want to uh, intervene. Yes, um, thank you, Stefano. Um, before passing on to, to Julio, thank you also for uh, summing up the discussion that emerged in the carbon market policy dialogue. I think the trust element is, is very important. Some, how it goes also beyond the economic aspect, right? Uh, indeed, you uh, correctly mentioned or stress that there are both economic and political implications. And when you have to decide which partner uh, you want to link to, uh, all these elements enter into, into the game. As you know, I like this because I, I also stress that in a in a recent paper that I uh, somehow provocatively uh, entitled Getting Married and Divorced, where I was playing with the uh, metaphor of the, the choice of a, of a different kind of partner, let's say, in a different context, but with many similarities. So thank you for reminding me. 
Okay, uh, I pass now the ball to Giulio, if he's, uh, here it is. So Giulio, the floor is yours. The screen is yours, actually. Okay, hello everyone. I will now start sharing my screen. Okay, I suppose you can see the slides. Simone, can you see them? Nothing is fine, great. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, now we can move forward to the second part of the webinar, presenting our report on linking emission trading systems with different price control mechanisms. So first of all, I will give you a brief, a brief story of this report. So the, as we have already mentioned, the report was firstly written as a background paper for the carbon market policy dialogue. And it was later enriched by the discussion that took place in the CNPD and later published as a public report. It is now freely accessible on our website. You can go on lifedigitproject.ui.eu, click on the resources tab, project resources, and then you will find both our reports and also the policy briefs that are the, let's say, short versions of our reports. So I will now introduce the concept of price control mechanisms and what they are. As you may already know, emission trading systems fix the quantity of emissions, but not the price, which is free to vary in the carbon market. The allowance price is thus uncertain. By price uncertainty, however, we do not mean volatility, that is abrupt changes in allowance prices or um, shocks, but we do mean unpredictability of allowance prices to stay within boundaries that are deemed desirable by an ETS regulator, as the graph below tries to exemplify. What are the inconveniences of having allowance prices that are either excessively low or excessively high that are outside of these desirable boundaries. If prices are excessively low, then the, the incentive to invest in low carbon technologies is insufficient. And it also might lead to increased capital costs for firms just due to uncertainty. But on the other hand, if allowance prices are excessively high, then the compliance cost for firms might be too high, might be too burdensome. And thus the, the ETS might lose political support by firms, potentially leading to policy reversal. What happened is that um, ETSs put in place some PCMs, the most common form of which are price floors and price ceilings. We will later explain how this works, but what uh, suffices to say for now is that price floors and ceilings are one way to prevent prices from going outside of these boundaries. In this graph, we can see the, a trend of allowance prices in a few ETSs. We have the EU ETS, the California, Reggie, New Zealand ETS, and the South Korean ETS. We can see that after the global financial crisis in, 2000, in 2008, allowance prices decreased steadily. And uh, ETS regulators tr implemented price control mechanisms in order to make the price go back up again. And we can see that it was effective. Um, we, went, we go from a situation in which if, uh, the allowance price in a few ETSs was uh, arguably um, ineffective in prompting uh, abatement and low carbon investments. For example, in Raji, the price trade for a very long time around two euros and the same could be said for the New Zealand ETS and so on. But the PCMs were effective in bringing the price back up. And actually all ETSs that are involved in the CMPD have some form or another of price control mechanisms. For example, the EU ETS has its trademark market stability reserve. And I say it's trademark because it's the only PCM that um, is quantity based. And we will later see what this means. The California and Quebec ETSs have an auction reserve price. The New Zealand currently has a fixed price options, but it's transitioning out of it towards new PCMs and so on. You can find all the details on the PCMs of the ETSs involved in the carbon market policy dialogue in our report. 
And if you want to have a broader look on all ETSs and their PCMs, you may go on the ICAP web website, where the ICAP is the International um, Carbon Action Program. And they have a very useful map with the old ETSs shown, and you can click on them and um, look at the details, also including which price control mechanisms are in place. So what we want to do in this report is trying to provide a taxonomy of PCMs and in order to compare them meaningfully. We identified five key dimensions of PCMs along which they could differ, they could diverge. The first one being their purpose. So whether the PCM is meant to sustain or to contain allowance prices. The second one is the trigger, so how the PCM is activated. The third dimension relates to discretion of decision which means whether the PCM follows automatic rules or it rather leaves some degree of discretion to the policymaker. The fourth dimension is the bounds of intervention, uh, which relates to whether the PCM affects only the primary market or the secondary one as well. Finally, we have the impact on emissions budget, that is how the PCM can affect the emissions cap of the system. I will now go more into detail of, of these five dimensions. The first one was purpose, so either contain or sustain prices. If we link ETSs that have PCMs with different purposes, so let's say that one ETS has a price floor and another has a price ceiling, then there is typically no problem, given that the price ceiling of, of, the, of the one ETS is higher than the price floor of the other jurisdiction. However, when the two ETSs have PCMs with the same purpose, so two ETSs link and both have uh, price floors or they both have price ceilings, uh, it is um, not straightforward to understand what will be the effective price color. So what will be the effective price ceiling and effective price floor? And it also depends on the bounds of intervention. That is the fourth dimension that we will see today. Suffice it to say for now that what could happen is that only one of the two floors or only one of the two ceilings remains effective while the other becomes obsolete and is superseded. As for the second dimension, the trigger, so how is the PCM activated? It could either be activated by prices, so we could say that the PCM is price-based. Um, if the PCM activates when the allowance price hits a predetermined price threshold. This is the case, for example, of the California auction reserve price that activates when the price falls to around uh, $17. And um, by contrast, a PCM can be quantity based, meaning that it relies on a supply indicator. Uh, this is the case of the EU market stability reserve, and it is at this time, the only ETS is that rely on a quantity-based PCM. Um, when, whenever the supply, an excess supply indicator is outside of the determined bandwidth, then the MSR activates. When we link ETSs that have PCMs that, are trig that have different types of trigger, then they may actually have a response that go in opposite direction. This is a very complicated mechanism that is explain more in detail in the report, but this may happen when price expectations are very high for the future, for example, due to an expected policy reform or a sudden policy reform, for example. The third dimension that we describe is degree of discretion. So how does the PCM follow automatic rules or it leaves some degree of discretion? If it is automatic, then the policymaker cannot intervene on the extent of the response. Where, and this is the case, for example, of the auction reserve price again. If the price threshold is healed, then the, the PCM is activated with no possible intervention for the regulator. By contrast, if it is discretionary, like the emission container reserve of Reggie, then it leaves discretion on the response. In this case, when, the, when a lower price threshold is hit in the Reggie, then the state regulator may decide how many allowances to withhold. Um, from selecting from a range between 0% and 10% of the state budget. 
when two ETSs link and they have different provisions according to degree of discretion, that there could be some free riding because each jurisdiction may be incentivized to choose to pick the response that is most beneficial to its own jurisdiction, but or even if it is detrimental to the partner jurisdiction. Moving on to the fourth dimension that we already hinted at is bounds of intervention. So whether it affects only the primary market or the secondary one as well. Uh, we here differentiate between soft and hard PCMs where soft PCMs uh, are the PCMs that only affect the primary market. Again, this is the case of the California auction reserve price. We said that uh, when the $17 floor is hit, it suspends auctions. And that's only affecting the primary market because in the secondary market, that is firm to firm exchanges of allowances, the price can still fall below the 17 threshold, the $17 threshold. By contrast with the hard PCMs, we have that both primary and the secondary markets are affected. So that this would be the case of the fixed price option in New Zealand, where uh, firms can buy as many allowances as they want as a fixed price provided by the regulator that is currently set at 25 New Zealand dollars. And of course, a firm will never buy from another firm an allowance at a price higher than 25 New Zealand dollars. It can buy, it can, if it can buy the same allowance for $25 by the regulator. So it is also affecting the secondary market. When two ETSs link and they have different PCMs with different bounds of intervention, then one of them can become obsolete as we have already said. Uh, but it can also happen that when PCMs with um, soft PCMs link, an upward slope supply curve may form, which is actually very good as it arose in, in the discussion from the carbon market policy dialogue. We, and we will later explain why. Finally, uh, the last dimension that we see in this report is the impact on emissions budget. So whether it affects the emissions cap of the system or not. If it does not affect it, it means that the, um, the PCM issues allowances that come from the reserve or removes allowances, but they, all, they go to feed a reserve that will later be used for injection. For example, again, let us think of the California auction reserve price. It suspends allowances and the actions that the allowances that are not auctioned, they are stored for future injection so that the emissions cap of the system is not affected. By contrast, uh, PCMs may affect the emissions budget if the allowances that are issued or withdrawn go to modify the, the emissions cap. And this is the case of the fixed price option since the regulator emits as many allowances as are demanded, even if they are in excess of the original budget. When we link when linking ETSs to the EPS PCMs with different impact on emissions budget, there might be environmental integrity issues because if one jurisdiction links with, uh, uh, with uh, New Zealand at the time, at this time, for example, that have a, a hard price ceiling, what happens is that by issuing allowances that are in excess of the original budget, the original cap is affected so that um, more emissions uh, to took place are injected into the atmosphere that was originally planned. And of course, this is a problem for jurisdiction with a very high commitment to climate action. And it also has implication for fiscal budgets since the, um, through the fixed price option, a jurisdiction might sell more allowances also to firms in the partner jurisdiction, thus having beneficial effect on the fiscal, on the fiscal budget, but having, by reducing sales and auction proceedings in the partner jurisdiction. I will now wrap up the key insights from our report. We found that PCMs may foster or hinder ETS, ETS integration. Um, a case in which it may hinder ETS integration is described by, is characterized by, is exemplified by the EU Australia case in which the EU asked Australia to remove its price floor in order for the two systems to link. The linkage never took place anyway because um, the Australian government changed and the new government repealed the ETS so that the linkage will not take place. But this is an interesting example. A different and opposite example, I would say, is the Reggie California case, in which California considered a linkage with Reggie, but ultimately discarded the idea because 
the allowance price in RAG was excessively low, as we have seen. Uh, thus, it was consistently outside of the desirable boundary of the California regulator. We also found out that hard PCMs are particularly troublesome for ETS integration because they have consequences on the fiscal budget and environmental integrity. So on the, on the say, um, consistency of the um, commitment to climate action. We also found that the scientific community, the academics have a strong preference towards price-based PCMs because they are more responsive to, price, to demand shocks and they also increase the allocative efficiency of the system. Finally, we found that um, linking by decrease is a way to mitigate adverse effects of differences between PCMs, where by linking by degrees, we mean implementing import quotas and exchange ratios in the systems in the linked carbon market. From the discussion from the carbon market policy dialogue, what we obtained is that the PCMs are effective and are useful to mitigate price uncertainty in the short and in the medium term. However, long-term political commitment is the single most important thing to point the way for allowance prices in the future. So that having a consistent and the ambitious climate policy framework is, this, is the most important thing in order to uh, signal effectively what you want the, the carbon price to be in the future. One second insight is that mutual trust is essential. Existing linkages were built upon robust relationships between the jurisdictions. For example, Switzerland and the EU are linked and they already have robust relationships as California and Quebec analogously. Finally, um, the CNPD highlighted that an upward slope supply curve is very important to cope with demand shocks and they also significantly increase allocative efficiency. And soft PCMs may, be, may come in handy in shaping an upward slope supply curve. So they are to be considered and they are to be preferred over hard PCMs. So it's over this presentation and check our report for an in-depth analysis on price control mechanisms, and now I will be looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Julio. Very clear, very interesting, and very hot as a topic, to be honest, because uh, these days uh, there is a lot of debate uh, on, well, on some features, for instance, of the European um, uh, ETS that are, as you presented, uh, set the European one apart from the other ETS. It's been quantity-based as compared to the other uh, price-based mechanism. Uh, or also talking about the market stability reserve uh, that is, uh, is always the object of great attention uh, and a hot debate. Uh, by the way, I have seen uh, Grisha Perino among our participants today and uh, so uh, I take the opportunity to, to say hello to, to Grisha, who has contributed and contributes a lot to this, to foster this debate. I think there is already, there are actually already a couple of questions. Uh, let me go through them. Uh, Victor Karamalis writes, uh, are there any mechanisms or curves? Should there be sudden or suspicious speculations in the market? Uh, we sometimes observe kind of uh, strange movements, so to speak, in the market. And uh, uh, the possibility that there have been a speculative uh, movement, I think has always, uh, has been uh, uh, observed or discussed also recently in the post-COVID, uh, well, unfortunately not post-COVID, post-lockdown phase. So Julio, do you want to comment on this? Sure. So yes, as Simone was already saying, we observed as speculative drive in the carbon, European carbon market. I'm talking about the EU now. Uh, and this prompted a few policymakers to consider a floor. And it was also argued by some analysts that a price floor, uh, sorry, a price ceiling would be useful in this situation to prevent excessive speculation. However, there are no specific PCMs for um, to contrast speculation and the PCMs in place to, to contrast price uncertainty are typically also effective to mitigate speculation. 
I would add on this regard that price-based PCMs are more effective in contrasting speculative drives because they are uh, they provide an immediate response so that if there exists a price ceiling or a price floor, they, uh, as soon as the allowance price hit those uh, boundaries, then the PCM activates. Whereas for quantity-based PCMs, then that is the example of the NSR, the market stability reserve, it takes some time to activate the response of the PCM so that uh, they are less well-suited to contrast speculative speculations in the capital market. I hope this answers your question. I think so, Giulio. And actually your answer, I think, drives us directly to the second question that comes from Grisha Perino, who was uh, asking, what are your main lessons from the linking analysis with respect to the future design of the UTS market stability reserve? <laughs> Stefano, you want to... Uh, answer maybe Julio as well, but yes. And uh, if I can add something to to the first question, I think that we have time for that. Um, to the previous question, uh, just want to say that uh, it's a mat the role of uh, uh, speculation uh, is uh, um, um, object of uh, of research right now in emissions the speculation emission strain systems. Uh, so there are concerns that. Uh, the role of, uh, of speculation uh, is increasing and will be increasing in the future. So this is a hot topic for, uh, for researchers. Um, so we can maybe then send the links to uh, uh, studies that are being uh, undertaken right now. And they were presenting in our uh, annual conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, as to Grisha's uh, question, um, well, something that struck me is that in the literature of, of, uh, of linking, um, the existence, the, the mere existence of a price control mechanism is seen as a, uh, an obstacle to, uh, um, to linking, to take, for, for linking to take, to take place. Um, whereas, I, 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 st I started to see also the other, uh, the, the issue from the, uh, like maybe in a more positive way in the sense that the lack of a price control mechanism can be uh, uh, a, a, an obstacle to, to, to linking. And why that? Because if you don't have a price control mechanism that gives, and specifically one that gives uh, uh, indications on, uh, that signals uh, a price, a long-term price range, a long price signal, uh, then it becomes riskier for other jurisdictions to link to yours. And this, of course, is the situation of the of the of the UTS, where we have the MSR, that is a quantity-based uh, mechanism, and it doesn't give you a, 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 a as it is now, as the MSR is today. Uh, does not give you indications about the price. Um, so perhaps if there was, and, and this, is, this is one of the one of the things that are being discussed, and I don't need to tell uh, uh, Grisha, uh, having a price trigger in the in the uh, in the MSR would help giving a signal in that sense. Now this was my uh, my personal uh, view. I know that it's not shared by uh, by many. Uh, and we and we know the institutional constraints that the EU has uh, in in uh, in establishing a mechanism that gives some price indication. Uh, well, actually, I should say what these uh, because it's not maybe understood to everyone that what these institutional limitations are. But there are concerns that uh, if you if you if you if you adopted a floor, or if you gave if you gave a, uh, price indications in a uh, in other ways, uh, there could be a a risk of this being interpreted as a as a fiscal measure, and this would would uh, would, get, would would raise the risk of uh, uh, fiscal measures which need uh, uh, unanimity uh, within the EU. Uh, so it will it would open this type of uh, of problems. Um, 
But yeah, so I hope that I answer to to Grishas that he understood what my my point is on that. Uh, so my point is uh, is that an MSR that has a price uh, trigger could help uh, linking. But this is my personal view. I don't know whether it's shared by others again. So thank you, Stefano. Yeah, Julia, yeah. do you want to jump in? Yes. Yes, please. Thank you. So. Stefano already said the, the main outcome. I mean, the scientific community actually is pointing towards a price-based PCM as being preferable to a quantity-based one. Um, however, what we could also add is that in the perspective of linking, that is the main subject of our records, we have seen that differences in the trigger dimension are, could be particularly troublesome when, when there are um, expectation of price increases or price sudden price decreases. So after a when a, a crisis occurs, for example. And so the way to better, in, in the perspective of linking, this also adds to the, uh, to why the MSR could have some price-based features at, at least. Thank you, Giulio. Thank you, Stefano. Uh, thank you, Grisha, for the question. Um, there is another question coming from uh, Marta Roslanich, and I take the opportunity to say hello to Marta, a uh, uh, good friend of ours uh, for other projects that we have been in contact with. And she's asking, after your research, what kind of linking problems between the various ETSs do you consider to be the most important? administrative, technical issues, mechanisms, uh, differences between the ETS. What are the, the real obstacles uh, Martha is asking? Uh, Julio first, Stefano. Okay. Then. So the main, I think that our two reports the, on environmental emission and PCMs are really strongly connected because we could say that um, as concerned PCMs, um, the main issue, the main trouble for linking is provided by the levels of the, of the PCMs. For example, a price ceiling being set at 20 euro could be too low for a, an ETS that has a, a floor that is 15 euros, for example. Uh, but this uh, reflects the different levels in environmental ambition of the two jurisdictions, which is the subject of the first report. Um, so that I think that two things really go hand in hand. So it's a matter of the commitment to climate action of the two jurisdictions. Technicalities are important for if the PCMs are one of them, but um, I think that they do reflect, they also reflect a um, more political issues that are to be negotiated. So I would just conclude saying that probably if I had to point to one technical issue that is the most important is uh, convergence towards soft PCMs. So that only affect the primary market and enable to increase the locative efficiency of the systems. Now I will pass the call to Stefano. Well, I, I, I basically agree with you, Giulio. Uh, I think I, I would not underestimate the, uh, I do not underestimate the uh, uh, difficulties of uh, harmonizing the many various uh, uh, aspects, uh, dimensions of, uh, of uh, ETSs. And because these uh, dimensions are many. And um, so from the use of sets, um, again, press control mechanisms, uh, allocation methods, uh, etc. So, for regulators, uh, it's linking is a it must be a very uh, a very a, a daunting job. Uh, at the same time, I think that the ultimate main uh, issue is um, convergence toward uh, toward a, a common uh, range of prices. So, having a and this also reflects the idea that basically prices are uh, 
I would argue the main indicator of uh, uh, ambition of uh, as, as I as I showed in the in the pre in my presentation before of ambition of uh, environmental ambition of NETS. And these prices are uh, variables that have uh, real effects in the domestic economy. So you want to have uh, some control to keep some control over these uh, over this variable. So I think that the main issue is political in nature, which is the uh, uh, price. Uh, but then there are many, many important, uh, I mean, technical challenges um, to solve if you want to link your ATS to another. Thank you to both of you. Uh, there is another question coming from Susanna Karamazana, and she's asking uh, about a, another hot topic, the expansion uh, of the EU ETS. Does the expansion of the scope of an ETS, for instance, the UTS, to cover transport and maritime emissions affect the potential linkage to other ETSs? Julia, what do you think about it? Well, I think that, first of all, is uh, Stefano's subjects probably to cover since he uh, dealt with scope with coverage in his report. But uh, I would add something afterwards, but I think he's the one to answer this. Uh, that's, a, that, that's a cheeky position, but anyway, I'll accept it. <laughs> okay, Stefano, go first then. Okay. Uh, well, personally, I think that uh, it's not, it doesn't pose a big challenge. Uh, it doesn't have uh, major implications for uh, uh, the uh, prospects of linking. Um, Again, simply because the uh, I mean, the price of your linking partner is the main uh, is the main uh, uh, viable that is considered in the, in linking decisions. Uh, of course, the enlargement and the change in the scope of an ETS uh, impacts can impact on the price uh, because depending on how elastic the, the demand of these new sectors that are under the ETS impact on the uh, allowance demand and therefore on the price. And also it has a role, you know, the change in the scope has a role in the fact that if you link to a larger ETS, uh, as I said, as I showed in my presentation before, uh, the weight, the size of the, of the linking partner matters uh, for the post link price. So it would give more weight to your linking partner if there are more sectors and therefore more emissions covered by the linking ETS, by the partner ETS. So in that sense, it matters, but it doesn't pose a, uh, like, uh, it's not, I don't see it as one of the main uh, issues in linking. Julio? I think that's definitely really said it all. So yes, I, I think that the main issue is how in enlarging, broadening the scope impacts the carbon price. Because if it, it is uh, expanded, for example, to maritime, you mentioned, and um, let's say that maritime would um, expand into maritime sector was, would decrease the allowance price. Well, this is a reason why this should be negotiated with the prospective partner or the current partner, because it might have an effect on the um, low carbon investments and the trajectory of allowance prices. So I think that's the main aspect to be considered. Thank you. Um, Stefano stressed a lot the, the price aspect. Okay. And I want to be a bit provocative uh, towards uh, Stefano and Giulio as well. Um, current price is very important indeed. So not the only uh, component, as you, Stefano, uh, pointed out. And uh, you consider as the proxy for stringency, basically. But as you know, not everybody agrees on that, that this is the only or the main stringency measure. Uh, and on top of that, I add, well, current price is important, but we should also look at what Julia just mentioned, the trajectory. So the, the possible um, uh, evolution of price. I, I think of the Chinese price, for instance. You know, the pilot project is very low as compared to the others, but we may expect this to rise and maybe rise rapidly in, into the future. So, um, yeah, but I would like you to comment on this, uh, whether we should look only at the current price or, or how we should, let's say, consider the future trajectories when 
um, evaluating whether to link or whom to link with? Well, I think that this uh, points exactly to something that we were saying before in response to uh, uh, Vishal's question, um, that if an ETS has a, um, a price control mechanism in place that involves a long-term price uh, anchor or a long-term price uh, uh, reference, uh, that is a strong singular, signal about the future price that you can expect in, uh, in your linking pattern. So I think that, yeah, I agree with you. And uh, I think that that would be the way an ETS can signal to other potential partners uh, its future evolution. Also, if just briefly mentioning that uh, PCMs do not need to be static, which means that they may be also automatically updated. If we look at the California and the Quebec ETSs PCMs, well, their price thresholds, both for the ceiling and it's actually some, they have multiple ceilings, I might say, they have containment points, they are dealt with in our report uh, or the floor, they are, they, they are updated, they increase by 5% each year. So that you can also understand what is the allowance price trajectory by knowing that the California and Quebec won't want their color to increase by 5% each year, which is very meaningful in understanding what is their commitment, long-term commitment. If I can add, uh, again, the, uh, I, I found, I mean, we, we, we basically agree on this reasoning, but, uh, um, but the literature stresses the opposite, uh, something entirely different, that the mere existence of price control mechanism is an hindrance, is an obstacle, uh, an obstacle to linkages. And so I find this, uh, I find this uh, interesting, I mean, a bit ironic. Um, yeah, that's my, just my. No, I know that it's the reason. I, I know there's a reason why uh, it's considered an obstacle because technically you need to, to you would you would need to come to an agreement to harmonize these uh, these mechanism. So it is an obstacle in this sense. But there's the other side of the of the coin that we that we just discussed as well. In you know, the potential to facilitate uh, an linkage. And talking about literature, actually, um, you mentioned, Stephanie, in your presentation, the difference between um, partial and general equilibrium uh, model approaches. And I would like also to, to mention the difference in results between static and dynamic models. Uh, as far as, for instance, um, the expected impact of linking on emissions abatement is concerned, because there are a few dynamic models and those seem to be more optimistic as compared to the static models uh, as far as the possible uh, contribution of linking to emissions abatement. So I think the dynamic um, aspect uh, should be further stressed in the literature uh, to understand the linking consequences and also to understand, as you were saying, the linking uh, capabilities, potentialities, and also in terms of uh, price or different price control mechanisms in this sense. Uh, wow, I hadn't noticed that we are running out of time, unfortunately, because I was enjoying the conversation. Uh, so since I, we have just one minute, uh, I don't think there is time for any other questions, but I, um, I would like to, to close uh, thanking all of you for, for your participation. Actually also thanking, uh, well, saying one word, on the fact that this uh, is uh, our attempt to translate the research into, uh, how can I say, into learning uh, and bring it to a wider audience. And uh, this exercise was done also through the online training that we just finished. And uh, I would like to say thanks to all of those who participate and Julio, Stefano were among uh, the teachers uh, in that course. And I was really, letter by the uh, positive feedback that we received. So I do hope that we will receive some positive feedback also from these online uh, uh, webinars of our attempts to translate research into, into learning that we are doing here. And 
on this note, I, I think that we can conclude. Just let me remind you that next week we have uh, an online debate uh, on carbon leakage measures and offset mechanisms, which are uh, two of the other uh, topics of our life digital project and of our reports for the future. So we are pre getting ready for the future, as you see. So please join us on uh, the 15th, if I remember correctly. And uh, you, if you go on our web page and through our socials, you will find all the information on these other events. So we wait for you there and we wish you a great day, all of you. Julia, want to add something? Yes, before concluding, uh, please also consider filling the survey that Albert shared in our chat to give us a feedback on what you think about this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. I tend to forget things. So fortunately, I have my team remind me of things. So again, thanks you all and see you soon. Bye.